for the kind invitation to speak. Um, I wish I could be there in person. As I mentioned to Dr. Katisa, I go to Rwanda um, every year, uh, right around this time actually, to operate with the uh, surgeons at King Faisal Hospital. And uh, so I enjoy coming to that area of the world. I'll, I'll give a quick story. My only connection to Uganda is, uh, as you probably know, when you fly from Kigali to Amsterdam, you have to stop in, in Uganda. And um, when we were about to take off, the last time I was there, the plane came to a sudden stop on the runway, uh, right when we were about to get off the ground. <clears throat> and had some engine problems. So I spent about six hours in Uganda. Unfortunately, it was stuck on a plane. <laughs> so hopefully one day I'll get to come and, and step foot and, and visit all of you there. So um, thank you to Katie and to the Ivy You Met uh, people for inviting me. Again, my name is Kelvin Moses, I'm Associate Professor of Urology at Vanderbilt University Medical Center, which is in uh, Nashville, Tennessee. And I'm gonna be speaking on multimodal management of advanced non-seminomous germ cell tumors of the testis and really discussing the role of chemotherapy and surgery. Uh, nothing to disclose. So objectives, we'll, we'll go over the incidence and staging. Uh, I'll talk about the medical treatment first and then going to uh, surgery, particularly in the post-chemotherapy setting. And then I'll talk about um, some of the surgery templates that are used and uh, some sp special circumstances uh, regarding surgery. So testis cancer is the most common solid tumor in young men. And in the US this year, over 9,000 cases will be diagnosed representing about 1% of cancers. The lifetime probability, at least in the US, is about one, uh, one third of a percent. Um, incidence rates are different in different parts of the world. In Northern Europe, the incidence uh, is twice what it is in the United States for white men. Uh, and black men uh, is 0.9% of case, 0.9 cases per 100,000. Interestingly, American black men have 10 times higher incidence than African black men. And just to go over some worldwide statistics, as you can see in, in uh, different parts of Africa, the adjuster, adjusted standardized rate per 100,000 is somewhere between 0.2 and 0.6 per 100,000, whereas in North America, it's about five per 100,000, so a good bit of a difference. And if you look at a map, um, uh, obviously you know where Uganda is. In Central Africa, the incidence is lowest. Uh, there may be a detection bias here, uh, but the, it is lowest in Africa and highest in North America, Europe, and Australia. So as you probably know already, uh, testis cancer is classified as seminoma versus non-seminoma. Uh, seminoma being the most common, and then of the non-seminoma is usually mixed histology. There are non-germ cell tumors, uh, benign tumors like Leydig cell tumors and Sertoli. You can also get metastasis, granulosa cell tumor, and thecomas or fibromas. Uh, mixed is the most commonly seen as far as uh, if it's not a pure histological type, and that's seen in 60% of cases. In regards to seminoma, classic seminoma is 80 to 85% of seminomatous tumors. You can have syncytiotrophoblastic elements, and so men with seminoma, which is normally considered marker negative, can have low beta HCG production. What used to be known as anaplastic seminoma is really just seminoma with high mitotic index. However, even though there are differences in histologic appearance, it actually has similar prognosis stage for stage as classic seminoma. And then there's spermatocytic seminoma, which is relatively uncommon. This is typically seen in older men in their 50s or 60s. And these men uh, usually only need orchiectomy um, and they do not have any um, serum tumor marker production. As far as non-seminoma, there are several types. 
And Brino, uh, as a pure type, is only three to four percent of testis tumors, but is present in up to 40 percent of mixed tumors. Commonly seen are lymphovascular invasion and epididymal or paratesticular involvement. Yolk sac tumor is typically seen in younger patients, infants, and children. And in, on the pathologic examination, you can see Schiller Duval bodies in one of the uh, patterns of yolk sac. Choriocarcinoma, also very rare, is made up of syncytiotrophoblasts and cytotrophoblasts. These typically present as small, non-palpable tumors, or what are called burnt-out tumors, but in the presence of extensive metastatic disease. And lastly, there's teratoma, again, rarely seen in pure form, but commonly seen in mixed tumors. Uh, these are uh, usually is mature teratoma, uh, representing more than one germ cell layer. You can have a malignant transformation of teratoma, and I'll get more into this when we start talking about surgery. So here's staging, uh, not to belabor this, but uh, one key change recently is that uh, in PT1, there is now PT1A or B for seminoma if it's less than three centimeters or greater than three centimeters. As far as pathologic staging for lymph nodes, uh, it has to do with size criteria. So two to two centimeters and five centimeters are the cutoff for pathologic staging. And then for metastasis, you either have non-regional nodal or lung metastases, and that's M1A, and M1B is all other metastases. The serum tumor markers are based on uh, measurements one month after orchiectomy uh, due to the half-lives and you can see the cutoffs here. Uh, for patients who need immediate chemotherapy, you stage their S classification as uh, whatever the uh, uh, marker is at the first cycle of chemotherapy. And here's the staging. For, so for stage one, it is uh, testis tumors only, no nodal disease, no metastases. You can have marker stage one disease, S1 through three, but those are actually treated like stage three. Stage two includes lymph node disease and stage three is metastatic disease or patients with uh, S2 or three disease. The IGCCCG further risk stratifies patients who have stage 2B or higher disease into good risk, intermediate risk, and poor risk disease. And this has to do with the primary site for non-seminoma if they have uh, primary retroperitoneal disease or S2 is intermediate risk and poor risk is primary mediastinal disease, non-pulmonary uh, metastases or S3 disease. The key fact for seminoma is that there's actually no poor risk seminomatous disease. Here's the survival rates for uh, stage for stage. Uh, as you can see, the 10 year survival for stage one and stage two disease is 95% or greater. Stage three is around 70%. And even for good risk stage three disease, it should be better than 90% if they receive the appropriate therapy. The radiographic studies needed for testis cancer, starting with a scrotal ultrasound to determine intertesticular mass, then there's abdominal staging with either CT or MRI. And then you need to image the chest. If the abdominal CT is normal, you can just do a chest X-ray, whereas if it's abnormal, then you should get a chest CT. A bone scan is only indicated if there's elevated alkaline phosphatase or patients have specific symptoms. Uh, we obtain brain imaging if there's a very high beta ACG, so people in the tens of thousands patients with neurological symptoms, patients with pulmonary, uh, sorry, poor risk disease, and patients with high burden of pulmonary metastases. There's actually no role for PET scan in staging, and we only use PET in the post-chemotherapy seminoma setting to determine any activity in a residual mass. So I'll briefly talk about medical therapy for um, uh, disease. Over the years, with the inclusion of platinum therapy, survival has increased significantly from uh, the 70s to over 95%. Uh, 
Again, when we go back to our risk classification, patients with good risk disease can receive BEP for three cycles or EP for four cycles, and their survival is over 90%. For intermediate and poor risk disease, however, these patients should receive BEP times four cycles, and if they cannot, then they can get VIP with a vincristine-based, uh, but all of them should be receiving cisplatin-based therapy. There's actually no good data for uh, efficacy of carboplatin in testis cancer. So for good risk disease, you really want to maximize the cure rate while minimizing toxicity. And the, the two largest centers as far as testis cancer treatment are Indiana University and Memorial, Memorial Sloan Kettering. Uh, at Indiana, they prefer BEP times three cycles. Uh, as you know, bleomycin does affect lung function and can cause fibrosis. So these patients have to get pulmonary function tests. Uh, at Memorial Sloan Kettering, the preferred therapy is EP times four cycles. Uh, due to the extra amount of platinum, they do get extra hydration to spare uh, kidney function. For intermediate and poor risk disease, they should get BEP times four. Cure rates are lower, 40 to 75%. And so therefore, there's several clinical trials and research in this area. Uh, VIP times four cycles is an alternative for patients who cannot receive bleomycin, but these patients do have to be watched closely and frequently have to be hospitalized because of suppression of bone marrow. When one important thing to note for chemotherapy is that there are long-term side effects or long-term risks. These patients, again, should have excellent cure rates and should, so should be able to live their normal lifespan However, it is important to note that dyslipidemia is common in patients who have received platinum-based chemotherapy and hypertension. So as patients are going along in their surveillance over the years, they should have good primary care follow-up or cardiology to uh, care for patients with, uh, at risk for hyperlipidemia and hypertension. So just to wrap up medical treatment, germ cell tumor is curable at all stages. Note that there is no stage four testis cancer. Uh, the biology dictates staging and treatments, and, and this is one of the only cancers where serum tumor markers are an important part of staging and dictate what type of treatment you receive. Standard care for good risk is BEP times three or EP times four, and for intermediate and poor risk is BEP times four cycles. Carboplatin is inferior to cisplatin and should be avoided, and a physician should be aware of long-term cardiovascular risk after chemotherapy. So I'd like to move on to surgery now, and the overarching theme I'd like to place here is that the optimal management of primary and relapse non seminomatous germ cell tumor requires chemotherapy and surgery, emphasize on both at sites of residual disease. And the biology influences the management. And, and the reason I point out biology is sometimes we focus on the radiologic appearance of disease, but really we should be focused on the behavior of the tumor. As you know, anatomically, the pattern of spread for testis cancer is very predictable uh, and proceeds in a stepwise fashion first to the retroperitoneal lymph nodes. And so for the right testicle, the primary landing uh, site is the interatocaval lymph nodes. And for the left testis is the paraaortic lymph nodes. Important to remember that there is right to left crossover of the retroperitoneal lymphatic channels. And I'll bring this up again when we speak about template-based surgery. And then uh, the spread continues to lung, additional lymph nodes, and then in order liver, bone, and brain. So some questions I want to discuss in the next several slides. Can the surgeon predict fibrosis versus teratoma versus viable disease based on radiological appearance or the primary tumor? What is the size cutoff for surveillance versus surgical intervention? Does removal of teratoma only pathology confer any benefit to the patient? And what is the role of template surgery? 
So beginning first with histology, as we know for patients who receive primary uh, uh, post-chemotherapy retroperitoneal lymph node dissection. Uh, about half of patients have necrosis-only disease. About 35 to 40% of patients have teratoma. And 10 to 15% of patients have viable germ cell tumor. These, these percentages are somewhat different for retroperitoneum-only disease within the lung and within the mediastinum. But we'll focus on the retroperitoneum. So, because necrosis and teratoma make up the majority of these, uh, the pathology, the conventional wisdom is that you could avoid surgery in 70 to 80 percent of patients after chemotherapy. So, can you predict histology after chemotherapy? Oldenburg looked in 2003, looked at 87 patients who had post chemotherapy retroperitoneal lymph node dissection after a CT showed no evidence of disease greater than two centimeters. And 33% of those patients actually had teratoma or viable tumor. And five out of the six patients with viable germ cell tumor actually had a mass less than one centimeter. So there's really not a cutoff to where there's no disease in the retroperitoneum. In a somewhat older study, Steyerberg et al. wanted to develop a model to predict necrosis based on six factors. If they had teratoma negative primary, if they had normal tumor markers, if they had elevated pre-chemotherapy LDH, if they had a small tumor, and if there was significant shrinkage of the mass. But even in patients who had all the favorable characteristics, the absolute probability of cancer and teratoma was 5% and the overall false negative rate was 20%. So clearly, uh, based on uh, imaging and pathology, we do need better uh, modalities to determine the pathology of the retroperitoneum. In this study that looked at, uh, sorry. And this patient, uh, uh, um, in this study out of Memorial Sloan Kettering, looking at the outcome of patients with fibrosis or necrosis only, 598 men. You can see here the recurrence free survival overall is about 94%, and the five year overall survival is 96%, uh, and 6% of men had recurrence. Uh, as uh, you might be able to see, but the patients who had embryonal carcinoma did better versus those without. And those patients who had bilateral retroperitoneal lymph node dissection had better survival compared to those who had unilateral surgery or template surgery and those who only had removal of the mass. So even in patients where pathology shows only fibrosis necrosis, there appears to be a survival benefit to more uh, uh, extensive resection. In patients uh, who, who had uh, ke uh, cisplatin-based chemotherapy and post-chemotherapy RPLND, uh, is the, the, the question asked here is, is RPLND needed after complete remission of visible disease? So in this study of 141 patients, they had normal serum tumor markers and no mass greater than one centimeter. They had very long follow-up of 15 years and 12 patients had relapse in that time. So a little bit less than 10%. Uh, six patients relapsed in the retroperitoneum and two actually died of disease. And five patients had late relapse, so greater than two years after chemotherapy. Uh, within the, the retroperitoneum. And there's some key factors to see here in the 12 patients who relapsed. Uh, number one, four of those patients did not get adequate chemotherapy. So these patients with intermediate and poor risk disease only got three cycles of BEP or EP when they should have gotten four cycles of BEP. And those patients uh, did not uh, relapse quickly, so within a year, and all of them died of disease. And so the assumption that patients who relapse can be salvaged with surgery may not hold true for those who relapse quickly. And what likely happened is that these patients harbored retroperitoneal disease despite a normal CT scan. 
Here again is another comparison looking at patients who undergo elective surgery upfront versus salvage. And as you can see on the curve here, the survival for patients who undergo salvage disease is significantly lower. And in comparison, 87% uh, of patients who had elective surgery had a complete resection versus only 72% for salvage surgery, surgery. You can see a significant difference in the rate of viable disease of 8% versus almost 50% in the salvage setting and transformation of malignant uh, teratoma. And that goes from 1% to 6%. And in the salvage setting, the survival drops from 89% down to 56%. So again, in these patients who are undergoing salvage therapy, you might not be able to uh, get comparable survival, even if you have timely uh, surgery after recurrence. And so although 96% of patients were able to successfully avoid surgery, and that is a good thing, uh, you do have relapses uh, occurring in patients uh, 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 within the retroperitoneum. 33% uh, of patients who had recurrence, so four out of 12, died of disease, when the overall survival should be 75%. So again, with these higher risk patients, we should be more aggressive. So going on to the question of teratoma, is it, is it uh, necessary to remove? Uh, as we stated before, 40% of patients will have teratoma only. Uh, however, the absence of teratoma in the testis does not ensure absence in the, in the retroperitoneum. And a study out of Memorial Sloan Kettering showed that 28% of retroperitoneal uh, teratoma in the retroperitoneum had no teratoma in the primary. Teratoma is chemoresistant and radioresistant, uh, and you can have variability in the behavior of teratoma. Uh, you can have a teratoma with primary yolk sac tumor, uh, and uh, you do not need further chemotherapy, though, if there's teratoma in the retroperitoneum. However, teratoma does have some risks. It can grow, which can cause obstruction or invasion of local structures and, and can become unresectable. Additionally, teratoma can undergo malignant transformation to non-germ cell malignant elements, such as sarcoma, or other carcinomas. And uh, additionally, teratoma may re result in late relapse and up to 80% will have viable tumor and their survival drops down to 30 to 40%. So while resection may not always be needed, the presence of behavior of teratoma cannot always be accurately predicted. Let's discuss now template surgery. So templates were designed to reduce the risk of Anti, uh, sorry, retrograde ejaculation, and also potentially avoid surgery in areas that are thought to be low risk for disease. Uh, template surgery is focused on the primary drainage of the testis, uh, either from the, again, from the anterior to caval tissue from the right testis or periaortic tissue from the left. However, all of these are based on anatomical studies with limited follow-up. Uh, the general, um, uh, design of templates for right-sided are to include the paracaval tissue and the interaortic cable tissue going from the ureter to the medial border of the aorta, uh, from the right renal vein all the way down to the bifurcation of the iliac vessels. Modified left templates are to include the paraaortic tissue from the ureter to the border of the uh, aorta, and the pre-aortic tissue uh, between the superior mesenteric and inferior mesenteric artery uh, up to the left renal vein. In this study out of Memorial Sloan Kettering, they looked at 532 patients who had bilateral post-chemotherapy RPLND, and they compared uh, their findings to what would have been found if uh, they had done templates based on four different centers, uh, one from Germany, from Indiana, Memorial Sloan Kettering, and Johns Hopkins. And as you can see here, 32% of uh, anywhere from uh, seven to 32% of patients, uh, if they had had a template-based surgery, would have had extra template disease that would have been left behind. 
And you can see here that uh, there was anywhere from uh, 19 to 22% actually had viable extra template uh, disease. And so in performing a template uh, surgery, you have to recognize that there can be uh, residual disease that is left behind. The histologic distribution of extra template disease is virtually identical to in template disease. So in performing surgery, you can perform nerve sparing in a bilateral uh, surgery. The uh, three areas that you want to maintain are the roots of uh, L1 and L2, the sympathetic fibers running along the uh, paravertebral space, and the hypogastric plexus as it spreads along the sigmoid mesentery. So after post-chemotherapy RPLND, for patients who have necrosis or teratoma, they only need observation and there's a 90% disease-free survival. For viable tumor, they need two cycles of chemotherapy if they have BEP, EP, or VIP. Uh, and this is very important uh, because patients who have already had chemotherapy and have now had surgery do not want more chemo. But the key thing to point out here is that their survival is 70% if they get chemotherapy and 0% without chemotherapy because these patients have residual systemic disease. So some take-home points for post-chemotherapy RPLND, you cannot predict the pathology of the retroperitoneum based solely on imaging. There's a 20 to 30% error rate. Uh, the resection of teratoma and fibrosis both have a diagnostic and therapeutic benefit, particularly in avoiding late relapse malignant transformation or poor outcomes due to obstruction. There's no consensus on size criteria for surgery and meticulous follow-up and, and salvage intervention may not lead to equivalent survival outcomes. Control of the retroperitoneum does require bilateral surgery with nerve sparing when feasible. And again, pathology is not the correct endpoint, but the biological and clinical outcomes. And so I'll wrap up with some special considerations uh, there uh, and challenges in, in post-chemotherapy setting. Uh, it can be technically challenging, particularly near vascular structures. And in the periaortic region, which is the most common area, that's actually, uh, at least in the United States, the area that is least fully sampled. Uh, a lot of patients will have retrocrural and suprahyalar disease, and so that requires further um, a uh, more extensive resection. And in the presence of bulky disease, sometimes a nephrectomy, bowel resection, uh, and uh, liver resection is, is needed. And in patients with pulmonary and supraclavicular disease, you should uh, approach either in the same setting or in a stage setting. Um, I'm gonna skip this. Um, as far as uh, uh, approaching metastasectomy, um, as for, in patients with liver disease, 33% have teratoma or viable germ cell tumor. And there's actually a high rate of histologic discordance from the primary uh, tumor or from retroperitoneum. However, in a multidisciplinary approach, there is higher survival. Uh, as far as lung, again, anywhere from 28 to 50% histologic discordance and up to 65% of patients with pulmonary metastasis have teratoma or viable disease. And in supraclavicular neck metastases, there's a high rate of teratoma, approximately 7% viable tumor. And again, a, a, a significant portion have histologic discordance. Um, the group from uh, University of Southern California have actually uh, incorporated extra peritoneal lymph node, retroperitoneal lymph node dissection. Um, in this uh, small study of 12 patients, they showed uh, some improvements, uh, shorter OR time, lower blood loss, higher lymph node counts, earlier return of bowel function, and shorter overall stay. And just some images. So here you can see they've opened the uh, uh, abdomen while maintaining the peritoneal sac. And they have a special retractor used to uh, mobilize uh, the peritoneal uh, sac. Now they cannot do this bilaterally, so they have to do either full template on the left 
uh, as you can see in the middle picture, uh, or full template on the right, as you can see in the far right picture. Uh, and again, they have done nerve sparing in, in this approach. And so for surgeons who have the expertise, this is a, a um, uh, potential approach. Uh, so just to summarize, overall testis cancer is a curable disease if it is approached systematically with aggressive treatment. Appropriate diagnosis, workup, and staging are necessary to determine the optimal treatment regimen. Predictors for absence of retroperitoneal disease based on imaging alone or the original pathology are frequently inaccurate. Chemotherapy followed by bilateral retroperitoneal lymph node dissection provides the best chance for cure, particularly in high-risk settings. Thank you very much. And I'll take any questions. Uh, how, how often uh, are you performing retroperitoneal lymph node dissection at your center? Uh, good afternoon, sir. Thank you very much for the lecture. This is Dr. Simwe. I'm a consultant urologist. So I came in a little bit late and I missed some of the talk because of uh, my network. We don't okay. do a lot of retroperitoneal uh, lymph node dissection if at all, uh, in my recollection, we've probably done one or two. We don't do it that often. But having said that, I think testicular uh, carcinoma is also a bit on the law. The, the one which has required us to attempt retroperitoneal lymph node dissection is, um, is a penile carcinoma. Okay. Yeah. I, I don't know whether you've got experience in that, uh, I know we've been talking about testis, but if you've got some experience in uh, penile carcinoma, uh, one of the gray areas was, uh, it's a bit gray, there are, there are arguments back and forth on when to do inguinal lymph node dissection. Uh, but in case it's not in your scope, it's okay. You don't have to comment about it. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, that's a, that's a great point. Uh, I haven't, I cannot remember if I've done a retroperitoneal lymph node dissection for penile carcinoma. Uh, for those patients with uh, disease beyond the pelvis, we've typically treated with chemotherapy and radiation. Um, I can see though, if, if, if there is visible disease, particularly if there's recurrence, um, that it could be performed. For inguinal lymph node dissection, uh, we perform uh, upfront, even in, in negative, on a negative exam for patients who have T2 penile cancer or higher, or if patients have T1 with high grade disease, uh, uh, including lymphovascular invasion. And in those patients, we'll perform inguinal lymph node dissection. If they have palpable mobile disease, we'll go ahead and perform it. But if it's fixed, then we'll perform chemotherapy first and then go uh, perform the inguinal lymph node dissection. All right, thank you very much. Thank you. Dr. Kilia, do you have any experience in surgery with uh, testicular cancer? Uh, incidentally, we don't see a lot of testicular cancers in Soroti, but I would like to thank Dr. Kelvin Moses for this very wonderful lecture. Maybe after his lecture, when we, we get subsequent patients that will qualify for retroperitoneal dissection, we shall seek his guidance on Zoom as we do the surgery. But incidentally, we don't see a lot of testicular cancer down here. I don't know why. Uh, I only remember one that we saw who had an intra-abdominal testis, actually 
it was uh, way high above the above the bifurcation of the iota. That's the only patient with vestibular cancer I've seen in the last 15 or so years I've been in Soroti. So I don't have much experience on retroperitoneal dissection. Even in centers where I've been, it was not something commonly done. So I've very little experience. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I would, I would be happy to observe and, and if we can do it uh, uh, virtually or uh, if you want me to fly there, I'll come and visit. <laughs> Well, yes, after COVID, you should. <laughs> yes, after COVID. <laughs> the United Dr. Epodoy, Dr. Epodoy, Dr. Epodoy, did you have any experiences of retroperitoneal dissections in motion? Did you see anything there being done? I can answer that. Hello? Not all. Okay, he's there. Hello? Yes, we can hear you. Uh, in Moshi, I've been there for two years. The occurrence of the stiff cancer is actually very rare. Very rare. We did not come across any. Very rare. We just came across it in the books. It's a very rare occurrence. Thank you. <laughs> Hope you had any experience. Hope. Dr. Hope. I think she's muted. All right, uh, Dr. Dr. Moses, we really want to appreciate you. Thank you very much for the presentation. Um, we really don't have so much experience with mm -hmm. the day sections. Although we've been in Mulago, we've been seeing a couple of patients, although very, very rarely, they come in once in a long while. Mm -hmm. So our experience is very, very limited concerning retroperitoneal dissections. So be very glad in case you are coming over to do any of those. We shall be very happy to, to learn a lot from you. And okay. um, just in case you have any, any, any videos or anything that, that is educative that can help, we are very happy to, to have it. And okay. We also wanted you to share your email address. Maybe once in a while, if you have some questions, we could drop you an email and and inquire from you. Get Absolutely. Some yeah. 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 Um, yeah, Katie Katie has my information. Um, if I, I'll have to look for a video. If not, I'll, I'll make one just for you. We shall be very grateful. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. All right. Um, if you don't have any questions for the fellows, do you have any questions, fellows? Any questions concerning the presentation? Dr. Badru? Any questions? Dr. Martha? If, if there are no questions, I've just remembered the case we did with Masaba. Yes. But actually, we, we, we opened and abandoned <laughs> because the mass was so huge. Mm. Uh, and this, this guy had had, um, had had a testicular tumor like a, a year or two earlier. And uh, I, I, I think he slipped through the, the, you know, the crack for follow-up. So we, we, we actually opened, but we never proceeded because it was massive uh, going around the main, the main vessels, the, the IVC and the outer. 
Mm. So really, our experience with retroperitoneal uh, surgery is very limited. So a video would be very good, uh, uh, Dr. Moses, would be very good for us to have and, and share widely. Okay. Well, uh, I'll work on that. I'll make sure I remind you. I'll send you an email. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, because I, I do need reminders. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right. Um, Kate, I think we're done. I think, I think we may have to stop here because it seems like people don't have any other questions to ask. We are very, very grateful for the presentation, Dr. Moses. Thank you very much. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, thank you so much, Dr. Moses. Absolutely. And thank Everybody, you, everyone. Have a good evening in Uganda. Hopefully see you soon. Bye-bye, thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs> Thanks, Katie. Yeah, thank you.